Hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's event, Woodlands for All, Is It Time for Hemel Hempstead to Branch Out? Uh, my name's Emma and I'm part of the team at Hope for the Future. Uh, if you haven't heard of us already, Hope for the Future is a climate communications charity which works nationally to equip communities and individuals to communicate the urgency of climate change with their local politicians. We feel it's vitally important that MPs and constituents have rich and challenging conversations about the climate, and we facilitate this by providing training for individuals and groups. Uh, we also provide tailored support at every stage of engaging your electric representatives, from writing your first letter to attending a meeting with you uh, to following up with them. Uh, and as part of our work, we also support individuals and groups to organize uh, events with their MPs, which, what, which is what brings us here today. Uh, you can find out more about um, how we support uh, constituents in engaging their MP by visiting our website, uh, www.hftf.org.uk. Uh, I'd also like to say a big thank you to Green Alliance uh, for providing the funding to run this event today, and also to the European Climate Foundation for funding our events project this year. Um, so for those of you that don't know, uh, today is Earth Day. Um, that's the little logo at the top of the screen. And Earth Day is an annual event on April 22nd to demonstrate support for environmental protection. It was first held in 1970 and now includes a wide range of events that are coordinated across the globe. So we've been working with Hemel Quakers, Carrie Baptist Eco Church, and a group of other, a very big group of um, other local volunteers um, involved in other groups in Hemel Hempstead over the last few months to bring this event together as part of the global calendar of events that is taking place for Earth Day this year. Uh, we're so pleased to welcome you, uh, the audience and our, our group members and our speakers, uh, to join us today for this event. So why Woodlands for All? Um, the COVID pandemic has shed new light on how we relate to our natural environments, with green spaces providing much, much needed respite during lockdown. Uh, the pandemic has had many people, has made many people more um, aware of the importance of green spaces in supporting our well-being but also has highlighted existing inequalities in access to nature. The local group that we've been working with are passionate about ensuring that woodlands are accessible to all, not just in Hemel Hempstead, but all over the country. Um, and they also want to ensure that they are protected, maintained, and new woodlands are created. Uh, Decorum Borough Council declared a climate and ecological emergency in 2019 and pledged to become a net zero organization by 2030. Uh, they've also developed an action plan to help achieve this and they already have officers working on it to deliver that plan. The council has also developed a 10 year strategy document which will be released later this year and as part of that the council are also hoping to engage with the public further. So that's all of you watching that are in decorum um, and once pandemic restrictions are lifted um, later this year decorum is going to be launching their climate action network um, and this is basically a network to bring together local groups, schools, organizations, and individuals to share ideas, best practice, and working together on lowering the borough's carbon footprint and increasing biodiversity. So all of our speakers today bring their expertise and experience from previous projects that have been run all over the country. Uh, so I'm sure that today's event will be a nice lead into the council's plans later this year. Uh, following today's event as well, we'll be asking you if you'd be happy to be contacted about the Climate Action Network, um, and that'll be via our feedback form. So make sure you fill that in if you are interested. So before um, we introduce our presenters today, I'd like to welcome uh, one of our local organisers, Mermi Kaga, to share a short introduction and welcome to today's event. Uh, Mermi joins us today to share why Woodlands matter to her, to the group and to Hemel Hempstead. So, Mermi, if you're ready, I will hand over to you. Hello to all. Woodlands of pine, beech, birch, ash and oak with an understory of shrubs, wildflowers, fungi, and with birds, mammals, and insects all supporting one another combined to produce clean air but cover a minimum of acreage in Britain. These woodlands are within walking distance of just a small part of the, of the population. Woodlands have been part of my life since childhood. My brother and I explored the woods next to our house. 
We wandered among the trees, heard the birds, saw the wildflowers and played in the little creek. Now, my husband and I often walk through a woodland that is almost as near as the one in my childhood. Our spirits soar, our minds relax. Now join me now in Bury Wood. How can we not work together to preserve and create Woodlands for All in Hemel Hempstead? As a member of Hemel Hempstead Quaker Meeting, where this event had its nascence in a Quaker Peace and Social Witness Forum, as a, res as a resident of Decorum Borough, and as an applicant for British citizenship, it is my great pleasure to welcome our speakers, our legislators, and our audience. Thank you so, so much, Mermi, for that wonderful introduction. Um, so this is the event that we have for you today. Um, we've talked a lot about trees and woodlands so far, but obviously woodlands are much more than that. Uh, they provide a whole ecosystem, which is why we're so pleased to kick off uh, today with Tim Hill from the Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust and he'll be discussing how we can address the climate and nature emergencies together. Uh, after this, we'll welcome three back-to-back -back presentations from Ethical Reading and Nature Nurture, the Woodland Trust and the University of Liverpool. Uh, we're so delighted to welcome our speakers to this event, and although the focus of today is on Hemel Hempstead, as I said, our speakers will be bringing their expertise and experience from all over the country. Um, and from their experiences, we'll learn how individuals, organizations, and our elected representatives can work together to achieve positive outcomes for green space, woodlands, and nature, and protect places like the wonderful place in Mermi's video. Uh, following these presentations, we'll welcome Sir Mike Penning, local MP for Hemel Hempstead, to briefly reflect on the themes of the event, the presentations from our speakers, and we'll also be inviting him to set out his vision for woodlands and nature in Hemel Hempstead. Um, from here, we'll head into a Q&A, which will be facilitated by my colleague, Josh, uh, with all of our speakers, plus Mike Penning and um, local councillor, William Wyatt Lowe, who's joined us on the call today. Uh, we've had a load of questions submitted in advance, uh, so we may not get to any questions that get put in the chat today, uh, but do still contribute them um, if you would like to, um, because we'll collate these and try and get some written responses to you. Um, and finally, um, we'll be joined by local conservationist, Dennis Fennell, who will bring us to a close. Uh, Dennis will be reflecting on his career in conservation, bringing us his local expertise and experiences of protecting, maintaining and creating woodlands local to Hemel Hempstead. Um, so I will stop speaking um, very soon, but just before I hand over to our first speaker, I'm just gonna run through some very, very quick housekeeping. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, so it'll be available for you to watch on demand. Uh, it's also on our Facebook page if you'd like to watch the stream. Um, we'll be sending all of our attendees a follow-up email next week with a link to this recording and directing you to Hope for the Future's latest resources, more information from the local organising group, and more information about Decorum's Climate Action Network. Um, we'll be doing our absolute best to stick to time this afternoon, and we're scheduled to finish at 2.15, with the Q&A finishing at 2 o'clock. Um, and finally, I'd just like to ask that everyone be respectful of all the contributions given in today's event, both from our speakers and from your fellow attendees in the chat. So I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, Tim Hill. Uh, Tim is the conservation manager with the Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust, leading on the trust work in the wider countryside for the wildlife and people. Uh, Tim's presentation today will focus on taking an integrated approach to addressing the climate and nature emergencies, as I mentioned before. And following Tim's talk, my colleague Josh, who's leading on today's Q&A, 
will uh, pop up and ask Tim a couple of follow-up questions before we head into our next presentations. So if you're ready, Tim, I will pass over to you. Good. Thank you, Emma. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to kick things off this afternoon. And uh, what I wanted to do was to bring um, a slightly different view and uh, address how important it is that when we think about the climate crisis, we also uh, recognise that there is a nature crisis going on amongst our midst. From my own perspective, I've been working for the Trust for 15 years now and work across Hertfordshire and Middlesex, working with local authorities and other organisations to try and affect biodiversity increase uh, across our counties. So the climate crisis uh, here in Hertfordshire, uh, from a county perspective, in July 2019, Hertfordshire County Council declared a climate emergency and in doing so, they've been working ever since to try and address that, uh, both within the organisation itself and by working with stakeholders across the county. As far as the nature is concerned in Hertfordshire, um, you will know that in 2019, a national state of nature report was published, highlighting in what a, a terrible state uh, nature was uh, in our country and following up from that we felt it was important to do a more local uh, report on the state of nature so in March 2020 literally as the first lockdown was called Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust published the Hertfordshire State of Nature this was produced in conjunction with the Hertfordshire Natural History Society the society provides um, recorders who go out and actually record all the species and habitats and obviously that's really important to know how nature is doing. So the report itself assessed over 10,000 different species recorded in Hertfordshire and how their status changed between 1970 and 2020. And uh, that infographic at the bottom shows really the highlights of those 10,000 species that were uh, assessed 7,696, uh, there were sufficient records to make some scientific basis of their status. And between 1970 and 2020, 1% of all species uh, became extinct in Hertfordshire, 19% uh, were threatened with extinction and 80% were at a lower risk. Just to highlight what we've lost in those 50 years, um, species on the screen there, top left hand corner, nightingale, one of our most iconic woodland birds, adder, white clawed crayfish from our chalk rivers, and willow tit, uh, another indicator of uh, good quality damp woodlands. So they're all gone, as well as 72 other species that were recognized as going extinct. So what's been the problem? Well, clearly uh, there have been changes in climate, uh, but this map illustrates the situation we have with grassland habitats across the county. Each one of those red areas is a grassland wildlife site, so of importance at a county level. And you can see it's such a fragmented situation now. What we have is small areas of species rich grassland left and uh, they're not connected to other sites. So species living within those sites, they become meta populations and they have great difficulty moving through the county, uh, meaning that there's, there's less mixing of populations. So we have a nature crisis, we have a climate crisis in Hertfordshire and we need a joined up solution to a joined up problem. This is a quote from uh, an international document. The science is now clear that biodiversity loss and climate change are inextricably linked and to tackle one, we need to tackle the other. 
Hearts of Middlesex Wildlife Trust, from our perspective, based on the State of Nature report and the climate emergency in Hertfordshire, we, we have a call to action. We're following Professor John Lawton's uh, rallying call that there should be more bigger, better and connected wild places. We're calling for at least 30% of our land in Hertfordshire and water to be connected and protected for nature's recovery by 2030. And in Hertfordshire, that means providing 20,000 hectares more land for nature. It's an emergency and big measures are required to tackle that. We need to start from the ground up. Carbon capture is, is clearly the most important thing. And Sir David King, uh, this is a quote from him that carbon capture and storage is the only hope for mankind. Clearly, we really need to reduce emissions, but capturing that carbon is so important. And next to our seas, soils wrap up more carbon than anything else. So we need to start from the ground up and rewild our soils. How are we going to do that? Hearts of Middlesex Wildlife Trust has a vision for wilder woods in Hertfordshire. Wilder Woods will be created by working in partnership. Partnership is the key to make things happen. We need to make more space for nature and capture carbon. So how will we do this? Well, wherever we can, we need to survey. We need to find out what's there already. There's no point trying to create new habitats where there's an important habitat in existence. Our wilder woods, they need to be more than just trees. They need to be a beautiful mosaic of woodland, meadow and wetlands. They need to be full of sunny glades and meadows awash with wildflowers and the pollinators that live on them. Wilder woods need to be alive with birdsong and buzzing with insects, with places for birds to nest on the ground, places for small mammals, cover in low bushes and in trees. And very importantly, these new wild woods, these new habitats are created, need long-term care. They will only optimize their value for wildlife and carbon capture if they're cared for. How are we going to do it? Well, I just wanted to tell you about an example of a project that literally started two weeks ago. Hearts of Middlesex Wildlife Trust is working with St Albans District Council and the St Albans Auburn's Environment Action Group. And this is a project called Wilder St Albans. It's a pioneering project in the city. And the idea is to help people to make more space for wildlife. Through consultation and forums over the last year or so, it's become clear that people really want to help and take action against the climate and nature emergencies, but don't necessarily know what to do, how, how to do it, or to coordinate that. So this is this project, uh, it's a two year partnership and it's funded by St Albans District Council for two years and with funding of £100,000 we're able to employ a people and wildlife officer who will lead this wilding project in St Albans. The first step will be an ecology audit of all the green spaces in the city and district again to identify what's there and the opportunities that we have. We'll create a web-based wilding plan for the city so that people can see what's going on, what's there and how to get involved. Uh, it won't be a paper document, it'll be a website so it'll never be out of date and it will be available 24-7, 365 days a year to inspire and engage with people. And the most important thing is that our people and wildlife officer Heidi Carruthers she will enable and facilitate community and business action for wildlife. We want everybody to get involved and do what they can. Notably so far, there's a, a tree action group in St Albans of which the Trust has been a member for a long time. And clearly there are, is action needed both to help create, establish more woodlands, uh, but to look after what we have. That's a really important thing because uh, we need to care for the best bits um, and then think about buffering those and increasing the size. I just wanted to highlight there that one of the uh, first wilding projects that's already established that will be taking place in August 2021 is the re-establishment of water bowls in the River Burr in St Albans. They've been missing since 1987. So we are doing a reintroduction project with the Burr Valley Society. So it's a mixture of planning and it's a mixture of taking action. 
but it's a case of it's not just about trees it's about all those habitats trees are really important but so are those other, other habitats if we're to conserve wildlife for the future thank you Thank you very much, Tim. That was a, a really, really wonderful um, presentation. We found it very informative and uplifting, actually, um, to hear about some of the action that's going on in Hertfordshire. Um, I have a couple of questions here, if we have time to get through them. Um, firstly, you spoke about um, kind of woodlands and habitats in a kind of really holistic way and the need to kind of understand them um, in the, their kind of broadest possible form. Um, we saw in the, the 2019 election a bit of an arms race as to parties kind of um, offering to plant, you know, 10,000 more trees in the next one. Um, how do you think we can move policymakers priorities from this kind of um, plant most trees idea to a more nuanced debate about the ways they need to act that are most appropriate for local areas and habitats and meet the needs of local areas and people? I think in Hertfordshire, we're, we're off to a flyer because we have the evidence base from that State of Nature report, which was published last year. So we know here in Hertfordshire, where the priorities are, what the losses are, and where we need to focus our attention. So woodland clearly will be part of that. And uh, what I'd like to say is I think that we shouldn't lose sight that nature will help us to establish more woodlands. Natural regeneration will take place very quickly if we allow it to. Uh, I live here in Harpenden in Hertfordshire, and there are areas of the common um, here in Harpenden that in 1964 were open grassland, and uh, through uh, no tree planting, no establishment of, of anything, and just, we now have a closed canopy oak and hornbeam woodland, which uh, is a beautiful thing to behold. So I, I think, as far as I'm concerned, it's a case of recognising uh, that all habitats need to be conserved, all habitats need to be considered in our planning for, for new woodlands. Uh, woodlands should have space within them, uh, with, with grasslands, with wildflower areas, um, and we should also consider how we establish those woodlands if we want to do that, and let's use natural regeneration as part of that, because um, so often nature does know best. Thank you, Tim. Um, it, yeah, it's really great to hear about the kind of the good work that's already happening in this area. Um, kind of moving on to a slightly different footing, um, you spoke about the kind of the, the twin priorities of tackling the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis that we face. Um, do you think that there are any potential tensions between these two priorities? Um, and if there are, um, how can we address those and kind of maximise the co-benefits between them? Uh, if there are tensions or if there are conflicts, the way we can overcome that is by talking so through. So events like this, forums, bringing people together and enabling people to talk to one another, to communicate and share those concerns is the most important thing in my view. Uh, we have this tree action group in St Albans established already and that enables different people to come together. Um, some will be more concerned about climate crisis, some will be more concerned about the nature crisis and clearly they are completely joined up and by working together in partnership not only individually or in, in community groups, but with, with organizations, local authorities, farmers, golf courses, businesses, uh, just by getting people in the same room or around the same screen. Um, I think that, that goes a long way to it. Um, I would also say that um, the initiative that we're doing in St. Albans, the World St. Albans, the benefit of that is that having a dedicated resource of a, 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 an officer, who is able to lead and coordinate this work, it makes a massive difference uh, because so often um, there are plans, there are initiatives without the right amount of resource to enable them to truly fly. And by having a dedicated resource, uh, somebody that uh, is there for people to go to, to get advice and guidance from, that makes a huge difference. And that person can also facilitate those conversations, uh, bringing people together so that both crises can be tackled at the same time. So integration is, is definitely the way. Thank you very much, Tim. I think that um, that hope for the future, we'd absolutely agree that um, an inclusive and effective communication is really, really important to this. I'm going to hand back to Emma now, who's going to take us on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Tim. 
Thank you very much both. Um, it was yeah, so great to hear so much talk at the top of the event about partnerships, which I think, and collaboration, which I think will be a running theme throughout this event. Um, so we'll now head into the first of our three presentations um, in this kind of section. And kicking us off um, will be Catherine McCann and Natalie Gantak Singh. Um, Catherine is on the advisory council and an active volunteer for Ethical Reading, a social enterprise dedicated to making Reading a better place to live and work through encouraging organisations to embed ethics into what they do. As part of the sustainability team, Catherine coordinates the growing network of sustainability champions at local organisations, as well as helping to run the Trees for Reading initiative, which we'll be hearing more about today. Um, Natalie is a forest school leader and artist striving to rewild people and places and co-create a world that supports wildlife and well-being. In 2011, she set up Nature Nurture, on a mission to connect urban communities with nature on their doorstep. Uh, based in Reading as well, uh, she believes that positive change happens through collaboration and has forged partnerships across health, education, housing and conservation sectors. So Catherine will introduce us to the Trees for Reading initiative and covering the hows and whys of getting that project up and running. Um, and Natalie will provide us with more of an overview of the health and wellbeing benefits of trees, uh, drawing on the example of planting in local school grounds. So I'll pass over to the both of you now. Thank you very much, Emma. So let me switch to sharing my screen. It's not working. One sec. Okay, there we go. Is that showing for everybody? I hope it's what I am seeing in front of me here. So hi, everybody, and thank you very much for this opportunity, Hope for the Future. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit here about urban trees and what we're doing to bring more of them to our town of Reading in Berkshire. Um, as Emma said, I'm a member of the sustainability team at Berkshire-based social enterprise Ethical Reading, and I'm going to be joined by Natalie Ganpat Singh from Nature Nurture, and she's going to be telling you a bit more about the benefits of urban trees for health and well-being in particular. So Ethical Reading is a social enterprise, as I mentioned, and as part of what we do to help make our town a better place to live and work, we launched the Trees for Reading initiative in November 2019. And the aim was to gather funding from local businesses to bring more substantial young trees to built up parts of our town. We developed and run the initiative in partnership with Reading Borough Council and Reading Tree Wardens. You can see here our launch event. That was the first tree that we planted in front of Thames Lido, our first sponsor. So it's a collaborative process. Essentially, it's all about connecting. So we're getting funding mainly from businesses to enable more trees to be planted in the town and to ensure they get the care that they need to survive. Um, so what we're doing essentially is helping Reading Borough Council to plant more trees than they might be able to do otherwise through that. So the council's new tree strategy was released earlier this year, and it includes a target to increase overall canopy cover from 16 to 25% by 2030. The council budget for tree planting was reduced due to central government funding cuts, which had affected the local tree planting budgets across the country. As a result of that, they were only able to plant 127 trees in 2018-19, compared to 242 the year before. We wanted to help by sourcing additional funding to make it possible to put in more trees, but at the same time, we wanted to give businesses the opportunity to make a meaningful contribution to improving the town. So why urban trees? Planting urban trees is not just about absorbing carbon emissions, because trees in towns and cities provide a whole host of local benefits as well. They create a haven for wildlife, they improve air quality, help to cool the air in summer, they absorb heavy rain, create better ambience, and really importantly, they help to improve mental and physical well-being. So this is where I'd like to pass over to Natalie to tell you a bit more about that. Thank you very much, Catherine. Yeah, so um, my work in Reading is very much connected with trees, connected with urban trees and these sort of nature spaces on people's doorsteps. And just listening to Tim there talk about the climate crisis and the nature crisis, I think it's worth looking at a third sort of crisis, really, which is around health. And, and you know, I think we're all very aware how much physical and mental health um, inequalities as well have been exacerbated with the pandemic and with about 28% of adults obese in our country, 
one in four adults experiencing mental health um, condition each year. I, I just think we can look at all those three things and actually sort of tackle them together. Um, here's a drawing I did about the benefits of trees. So sort of looking at some of those things Catherine has mentioned, a lot of my work is around supporting the mental health and physical health benefits of, of um, connecting people with nature. And I just want to delve into some of the amazing growing evidence base which I think you know we really need to shift away from seeing nature and trees in urban settings as these sort of pleasant appendages to this sort of urban landscape but actually very much crucial so if we take a look at physical health first so um there's some really interesting evidence around greener neighbourhoods and associated with healthier people. And that's even when they look at the socioeconomic differences at the same time, they do find that places with greener neighbourhoods and the speculation is around people's increased motivation to get out and walk in these in these much more pleasant spaces. Um, and I think as well, you know, again, in the context of, of the lockdowns, people that has been one of the only places people have been able to be active is those those sort of local parks and woodlands and spaces like that and then on to mental health and well-being um, it turns out from some really compelling evidence from the University of Essex that even just five minutes in nature can improve our mood and self-esteem um, research going back to the 80s was a American researcher called Wilson and he looked at the rate of patients in hospital recovering and found out that the view out of the window looking onto green spaces and green foliage actually improved recovery rates of um, patients compared to if they were looking out of windows into sort of urban spaces um, and also in terms of productivity in, in workplaces there's um, again looking out of windows office workers who can see nice green spaces out of their windows um, according to this research were about 23 percent fewer periods of time off sick and express greater job satisfaction um, and what's quite interesting as well in terms of being physical active outdoors um, the more natural the space the more rich in biodiversity the better it is for our mental health as well so walking around a, um, a recreation ground, like a sort of plain recreation ground can do good for your health, but actually the more nature there is in that space, it's even better for our health. And then this is quite a surprising one around social ties and reducing crime. Um, there was a study by a researcher called Co in Chicago, looking at um, trees and social ties and crime and found that neighborhoods with um, more trees, there was actually less prevalence of crime. Um, and then on to air quality. Um, I think we're more and more aware of um, air, air quality situation and I think especially in terms of the dangers of people having sort of underlying respiratory conditions it's sort of never really been so important to look at tackling air qualities and look at the role trees play in in that sense as well um, and in terms of our immune functioning um, spending time in areas with trees and especially a sort of more ancient woodlands can be really boosting of our immune system and trees actually emit something called phytoncides and when we as humans breathe that in it restores our natural killer cell activity which really boosts our immune system and um, then there's the benefits of the connection with the soil as well and there's more and more around the microbacterium in our in our gut and our response there and the serotonin in the brain connected with soil as well um, and jumping on to the heat island effect, please, Catherine. So this is this is an interesting one. It's where they measure temperatures in urban areas. And it seems that structures like buildings and roads that really do absorb and re-emit the sun's heat more than natural landscapes. So when we, if we can increase the tree cover in our towns and, and preserve what we have in terms of tree cover, we are going to have less heat and less heat associated deaths as well. Um, and then finally looking at tackling health inequalities. And I think this is a really interesting one because as we look at 
increasing nature in um, urban areas, it seems that the areas which are really lacking biodiversity and trees are often those areas that are suffering the most inequalities and those areas of deprivation. So it's just when we start thinking and prioritizing about where to plant or where to restore woodlands, I think it's really worth looking at those indices of deprivation at the same time as looking at the, the, the state of nature in those areas. Um, next slide, please, Catherine. Yeah, and this is all really around nature-based solutions. And there's, it's really good to see in the government's 25-year plan for the environment, it's really valuing nature in terms of the ecosystem services um, it provides. And some of us might not like to have that sort of monetary idea of, of nature, but it it's, it's really makes the case for nature way more powerful if we can talk in some of those economic um, terms. Um, next slide, please, Catherine. Um, yeah, just a bit about our work. So one of the main areas of our work is supporting schools in how to use their grounds, how to improve their grounds and how to connect their kids with that, those local woodlands on their doorstep. So this is a project we did called Growing Among Trees, thanks to funding from DEF from the Department of Education. And it was all about how we improve health and well-being for um, children through through different um, wild teaching programs. And a big part of that was tree planting in school grounds. And you can just see how happy these, these children are to be involved in that. And I would say with any sort of tree planting program, sometimes it can be tempting just to work with people who are very much know a lot about nature already and know a lot about trees and tree planting but if you can take any opportunity to reach out to schools or other community groups and really fully involve the the community in that i think i think we can then you nurture a community that's going to help look after those trees and, and value those trees so i'd really recommend that and next slide please and just a quick one about um, partnerships. So this has been really key to the way we've worked in Reading. So we're really lucky to have partnerships and in fact funding from the Housing Association. Um, we've tapped into social prescribing funding where people are, are put on sort of nature programs to support health and wellbeing. Um, Catherine said about corporate volunteers, which are, are and corporate funding, that's really crucial. Um, conservation charities, so in Reading we've teamed up with the conservation volunteers. Um, I don't know lots about Hemel Hempstead, but when I had a quick look there, there's obviously, you know, Tim's spoken about the, the Wildlife Trust and their role. I noticed there's the Boxmore Trust, and I, it's just, there's likely to be organisations really keen to, to get involved with you, and I'd say to, to partner up as much as possible. So, yes, that's me, and that's back over to you, Catherine. That's brilliant. Thank you, Natalie. So where are our trees going? When we first started to develop the Trees for Reading initiative, it was back in August 2018, we were planning to focus on adding more trees, mainly in the town centre, because we thought they would make the most impact there. But then when we spoke to the council, we realised that was going to be quite challenging due to the high levels of hard standing and underground utilities. So we refocused and we decided to try to put around 10% of our trees in the town centre, 50% in other areas that would benefit most, like deprived areas and schools, and the remaining 40% elsewhere in the borough. Then we came across iTree Canopy data, which actually confirmed that we had set our priorities right. So Abbey Ward, which makes up the majority of the town centre, has got just over 11.6% tree cover. And then other more deprived wards like Whitley and Catesgrove fare even worse with only 8 and 10.4% tree cover. That compares to 32% in the more affluent area of Maple Durham. Sadly, there is a real correlation between tree cover and social deprivation, and that's something we'd like to level up a little bit here in Reading. So here's a little map that shows our progress to date. So in our first tree planting season last year, we planted just eight trees, but this year we've managed to provide funding for a further 25. Uh, there's 10 containerized ones that are still waiting to go in. Uh, but you can see our progress to date on the website and we'll be updating it shortly with a few more trees that we'll be adding in. Uh, here are some examples of business funded trees that we've put in. As you can see, they're not little whips, they're substantially young trees. They do make an immediate impact, but they need watering for a couple of years to help them get established. And the funding we passed to the council covers that. And they've also committed to replacing any that don't make it at no extra charge. All the trees will be uh, marked with a plaque, so you'll be able to see how they came to be there. 
Um, we've also worked with the local community through crowdfunding to add in some extra special trees. So in the first year, we planted this tree, which is a beautiful flowering cherry in association with Brighter Futures for Children. They arrange foster placements to help children. So the, sorry, the tree will help children feel more rooted in Reading. The idea actually came from a 14 year old boy. Uh, he'd been placed in foster care outside Reading and he was feeling he was losing his connection with the town. So he felt that this tree would really help him. And it's been a really symbolic gesture, which has meant a, a lot to other children in care as well as to him. Um, this year we've planted three trees uh, in honour of people who've lost their lives to respiratory conditions, including COVID, which was inspired by the campaign run by the family of Ella Roberta, who sadly lost her life to asthma related to air pollution. So as people have mentioned earlier, Tim mentioned it and Natalie mentioned it, it's all about collaboration. So that's one of the key values at Ethical Reading, and it's exactly what the initiative is all about. Um, it's through our connections with the local community and especially businesses that we're able to provide this additional funding to bring more trees to the parts of town that need them most. And working hand in hand with the local council and tree wards has been the trees are selected carefully, planted in the right place and looked after to ensure they survive and thrive. Maybe this can provide some inspiration for Hemel Hempstead to possibly bring more urban trees there. I hope so. So thank you very much all for your time. Thank you, Natalie, for helping me out with this. And um, both of us will be available in the panel discussion a bit later on if you've got any questions. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, I'd now like to invite Owen uh, to join. Um, so Owen um, has worked for almost five years in the external affairs team at the Woodland Trust, the UK's largest woodland conservation charity. Um, and Owen joins us today to talk about how we can consider tree planting in the planning process, particularly for residential developments, uh, which I know will be um, of a lot of interest to Hemel locals particularly. Uh, and for this, he'll be drawing a lot on the Woodland Trust document, Resident Residential Developments and Trees, which I'd be happy to share with all of you in the follow-up email. Uh, so, Owen, I will pass over to you. Thanks very much. Um, hi there. I, I'm sorry that I won't be um, sharing a delightful PowerPoint as my predecessors have done, um, although I, they were very uh, engaging and very um, colourful and helped to uh, emphasise a lot of the important points. Um, I'm afraid you've just got me. Uh, and uh, I, I thought that would be more so people can, can focus upon uh, exactly what it is I'm going to be saying. Uh, as as uh, has been Emma has pointed out, uh, I'm going to focus largely on, um, on the uh, document residential developments and trees, uh, but I will build from that onto uh, two additional documents, um, the emergency tree plan, which the Woodland Trust published um, last year, and also the report that we published only last week, the State of UK Woods and Trees, both of these help to build upon some of the recommendations from the residential developments and trees um, document. It should be said that uh, I'm delighted with uh, what's been said by uh, the previous speakers. It does cover a lot of the information <laughs> held within the residential development and trees um, document. Um, really, the key things um, to focus upon are when you are considering um, new developments, um, you need to be sure uh, for start of what you've got. Uh, that this can all, you know, what you've got in terms of um, woodland um, around you uh, in terms of uh, closeness to woodland um, and you know you may not realize that the wood uh, in front of you that you're planning to plant right up against uh, is going to be uh, an ancient woodland in which case um, there are certain things you really should not be doing um, so to start helping with that you can do um, an eye tree um, survey as as has been uh, pointed out to by other uh, speakers on this call um, sorry my legs are just getting stuck I think my desk very unhelpfully um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so um, the key point is to emphasize that within um, new developments, um, you should really be uh, looking to emphasize tree cover. Um, the Woodland Trust recommends a canopy cover um, of 30% with uh, new developments. And although um, you'd be hard pushed to find a local authority that's actually hit 30% yet with a new development, several are making very uh, encouraging starts. Um, Birmingham, I know, is pushing for uh, 25%. Uh, and other local authorities are pushing for similarly high numbers in the 20 to 25% range, which is a very encouraging start and should help to achieve 
closer to more people pushing for 30 uh, percent and this is because trees provide so many benefits to urban areas some of these have already been pointed out before um, trees help to tackle flooding um, trees uh, interspersed within developments help to uh, reduce surface runoff by up to 62 percent compared to asphalt um, and with air quality um, a single row of uh, silver birch trees running alongside uh, or in front of um, terraced housing um, can help to reduce um, air pollution by up to 50 percent for those houses and behind those trees who are screened in this way um, and, and as also been mentioned the urban heat island effect is valuable valuable feature that can be um, tackled by interspersing trees within development within planning uh, applications uh, in Manchester um, alone studies have been conducted showing that uh, urban trees have helped to reduce surface temperatures by as much as 12 degrees uh, in in some parts uh, because as has been said you know these places are very uh, urban areas can be very concrete heavy can be very uh, heat intense and taking a lot of the heat and reducing it releasing it then at night um, there are of course uh, numerous um, benefits to mental and physical health, as have been alluded uh, by uh, previous speakers, uh, but these include um, reductions in uh, stress levels uh, and blood pressure, even just by being able to see a tree and may explain why uh, in previous um, generations, uh, when houses were developed, there were specific um, goals for people to be able to at least see a tree from their house. Um, certainly that's something I, I think should be uh, reintroduced. Um, let's not forget though that the trees being implemented as part of developments help to improve road safety as well. Um, as statistics show, there's a 36% reduction in crashes on tree-lined roads. And even when these crashes occur, there's an 86% reduction in costs as well from those crashes. So there's win-wins for um, all sorts of people. Um, so really, the, uh, the fundamental points when you are considering a development are, uh, first of all, ancient woodlands are irreplaceable and are protected uh, by the National Planning Policy Framework. Uh, so you, you really shouldn't uh, be going anywhere near an ancient woodland. An ancient woodland is woodland that has existed for at least uh, 400 years um, since maps began in 1600 with any great accuracy. Um, and although the NPPF was strengthened in 2018 to uh, raise the protection for ancient woodland. Um, this, has, uh, you know, th this has seen a uh, reduction in the number of direct losses of ancient woodland since 2018 when this change was implemented. However, um, the number of actual threats facing ancient woodland from development has risen to more than 1,100, which is a record high. So there's swings and roundabouts. Um, you must also remember that uh, if you are going to be building near ancient woodland, um, then you must install a buffer. Uh, and by this, um, I don't mean a high wall. Um, I mean kind of like a nature buffer. Um, you know, it could be grassland. It could be some sort of, uh, you know, fabulous um, green strip that, that uh, I'm sure Tim would smile upon. Um, but uh, buffers, generally planners go for um, anywhere from uh, 10 to 15 uh, meters. We would like to see a 50 meter buffer. Um, from development work around ancient woodland because um, the effects essentially of the I mean, the indirect effects that you are creating otherwise if you have uh, development right up um, against an ancient woodland are so horrendous that um, that you're going to you're going to see a, a gradual decline in the quality of that ancient woodland uh, which means you're going to see a loss of wildlife flora and fauna uh, happening um, the third and most crucial point, I think, is, is connectivity uh, needs to be considered when you're doing any sort of development. Um, as has already been emphasised, people, you know, have a very um, good reaction to um, nature. But uh, recent statistics published in the UK State of Woods and Trees report, which um, I can also, I'm also very happy to provide a link for, and I wish I had a copy with me, but given COVID, I'm not able to go into the office to get one. Um, show that only 16.2% of people in the UK have access to a woodland of at least two hectares in size within a uh, five to 10 minute walk of where they live. Um, this is quite shocking and has um, undoubtedly led to some of the scenes that we've seen when lockdown has been um, lifted at various stages of queues of cars at nature um, spots at uh, woodlands. The Woodland Trust has certainly seen uh, car park calamities, uh, maybe not calamities, but certainly car park um, issues, especially at some of our most popular sites like um, 
uh, Hitchin and Harpenden's Heartwood, um, which uh, is, is one of the largest um, site, um, woodland sites and has been uh, seen more than 600,000 trees planted uh, in recent years. Um, and this is because people want to access nature. They want um, to enjoy the benefits that come from it. Um, and they don't have access to it. So this is something that needs to be fundamentally considered when um, planning um, any kind of development is taken into account. You need to think, is there a pocket park I can put in? Is there a small um, woodland area that I can incorporate um, or even a large woodland area? And as uh, Tim was alluding to earlier, it doesn't just need to be blocks of trees. It can be trees with woody glades. You know, it needs, it just needs to essentially follow the idea that it is the right tree in the right place. As I said, that doesn't always need to be blocks of wood. Um, however, in order for local authorities to take advantage of this, there does need to be um, policy in Westminster to drive this. Um, the net gain requirement for new developments uh, must be uh, delivered and not rolled back on um, if nature is to survive its encounters with developers. Um, this is uh, fundamental and, and I believe is being delivered through the Environment Bill. So that should be um, very um, encouraging um, to see brought forward. There are also local nature recovery strategies. Again, this is an amendment to the Environment Bill, which it would be very good to see delivered because this would see local authorities have to give more due care and consideration to um, local nature recovery strategies when making plans and considerations for new developments. Um, I think that... Uh, the Woodland Trust has an access standard, basically, which calls for people to have access to um, at least a two hectare woodland within 500 metres of where they live and a four hectare plus woodland within a uh, 20 minute um, journey of where they live as well. And, uh, and this needs to be improved if people are to gain the benefits that come from woodland access. Um, as was alluded to by a previous speaker, it can have major mental and physical health benefits, including reduced BMI, in, especially in children, reductions in circulatory and respiratory diseases, including asthma and heart disease. Um, and uh, recent studies from 2018 show that uh, the time adults spend within the natural environment has led to health benefits equating to 2.18 billion pounds. Um, and that's just with present data. Um, I'm sure that even more um, data studies in the future will show that this is only going to um, improve. So um, the final point I will make is that when you are planting trees, um, you really should plant sensibly for the future. And by this, I mean, use trees that are sourced and grown in the UK. Um, every tree planted by the Woodland Trust um, comes through our assured UK ISG standard, that's UK Ireland sourced and grown because of the work obviously that we do with uh, North, in Northern Ireland um, as well. But this is the best way to ensure that what is planted is free of pests and diseases, which otherwise fell the tree and its kindred in the near future. We've already seen the devastation of Dutch elm disease had in our country and are starting to see the effects of ash dieback, which will likely cost 95% of our entire ash population and 15 billion pounds to the economy. To prevent similar incidents like this, we need to plant um, trees that are sourced and grown in the UK. And local authorities can in fact do an enormous amount uh, to help with this by uh, following the lead of other um, people uh, of other local authorities who are working with the Woodland Trust, and I'm happy to uh, be a, a point of contact for this, uh, in setting up uh, their own tree nurseries, uh, which meet this UK ISG assured standard. Um, and that is something uh, that can certainly, uh, you know, deliver, that can be done through with community groups and can be done, you know, to build local skills as well with apprenticeships and and you know, even the new generation of green jobs. So this is certainly something that uh, a message I would want to uh, impress upon people um, as, as we uh, head into um, the future. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Owen, uh, for that brilliant presentation. Uh, no slides required, I don't think. Um, so I'd now like to welcome our final speaker um, in this section. Um, Dr. Sarah Clement. Sarah is an environmental policy and governance researcher at the University of Liverpool and her work focuses on nature-based solutions and addressing biodiversity loss, climate change, and other complex environmental challenges in the Anthropocene. Uh, she's also the principal investigator for the Urban Green Up project uh, at the university, which is where uh, we kind of got in touch. Um, and she's involved in monitoring the impact of greening interventions on social, economic, and ecological issues in the city. 
so I'd like to invite Sarah to uh, start her presentation where she's going to be sharing her experience and expertise from previous projects in Liverpool and the surrounding areas. Hello, thank you very much. Let me just um, pull up my slides. Um, I feel like everyone kind of set up my presentation really. I mean, it's particularly the Reading presentation, I think leads into some of what we've done in Liverpool and why it's so challenging to um, reintroduce nature into a city once you've lost it. So um, there's been discussions about the various things that green space can do throughout this, um, this seminar today. And these are the different challenge areas that we're actually investigating. When you take an area that's gray and you green it, what difference does it make to these 10 societal challenges? So the European Commission has funded a, a, quite a few of these projects across um, Europe and elsewhere in the world to look at what the impact is of greening urban areas. So um, this is just to, I'm not going to go into any detail here, it's just, just to show you that we kind of are looking at um, what are some potential actions that you can take to green urban areas or non-urban areas and what are the expected impacts and all the evidence base. So if you are interested in that, that, that eclipse framework, there is a sort of public report that's out there. It's not just in the academic literature, but it sort of collates all of that, all of that data. So um, the project that was mentioned in my bio and a project that I'll talk about today is the Urban Green Up Project where we're testing whether nature-based solutions can make a difference. And these are the, the cities that are involved in urban greenup. But as I said, there are other projects around the UK and around Europe and abroad. Um, so, you know, Liverpool is particularly challenging. I thought it was interesting that they mentioned in Reading how challenging it is to plant trees in urban areas. Um, we have, for example, one of the neighborhoods that we were meant to plant trees, we found only three locations where you could actually plant trees into the ground because of all of the development over so many centuries um, make it so a lot of that, that land, there's just so much, so many utilities and everything underground. Um, you also have issues with heritage listing and the, the issues that that creates with, um, we have a world heritage area. So there are a whole lot of issues with actually regreening um, a place like Liverpool and many cities in the UK. Um, so also similar to what was discussed about Reading, Liverpool has a massive problem. Not only is it one of the um, most deprived areas in the UK, but the greenest parts of um, Liverpool are near to the more affluent areas and the, you know, the less affluent areas have access to very little um, green space. So we have put in um, uh, green interventions in these three areas, which you see on the right hand side here, um, and have kind of looked at how are they addressing multiple challenges. So previous studies have kind of looked at how does it affect health, how does it affect climate change, we're trying to bring all of that together to test what the impact might be. Um, and we have you know, major issues with Liverpool doesn't really have a lot of funding to manage green spaces. So getting this funding um, was, was a really big benefit to us. So I'm just showing that to show that um, each of these areas has a, you know, dozens uh, of interventions within it. So I'm not gonna really talk about those today because I only have 10 minutes. Um, but if you are interested, you can actually look at the Urban Green Up website. And this is just a few examples of some of the things that we've done. So because we can't plant trees, we've done things like putting trees in containers. Um, we have had the benefit of, uh, there's a massive road in Liverpool called the Strand, and we've been able to sort of get in on highways plans to narrow that road and put in some trees along there, but they have specially designed tree pits that also work to address water quality issues and flooding issues. So everything is meant to have sort of multiple purposes. And that you know overall trees haven't been the the thing that we've been able to plant the most of because of all of the issues with actually getting trees in the ground so we have had things like this forest bathing pod where you can immerse yourself feel like you're in a forest in the middle of the city we have several floating habitats um green walls and um various gardens so it's it's a mix of things really that we've done and at the same time we've also been looking in the wider liverpool city region to um, develop a natural capital baseline to say what are the assets that we have, what functions are they providing, and here I have a climate change example, um, and how, how well are they performing, and that can drive investment into those different areas to see where you need to actually enhance um, the, 
the natural the natural assets so that they actually perform those functions of climate regulation, air quality regulation, water quality regulation, that sort of thing. Um, and we've been able to integrate that into the spatial development strategy. We're hoping it will it will end up being in there, and also to use that to develop an investment plan. So. Um, outlining how you might actually invest in those enhancements. So it's a more sort of economically driven way of doing things, but it can help to prioritize and emphasize. And I know some people might not like a natural capital approach because it is driven by money, but um, it can be very effective. And then broadening out, you know, what's happening in Liverpool really is part of this wider effort to green the North. And I'll talk a little bit about two, um, two projects that the Mersey Forest is involved in, and they're one of the partners on Urban Greenup along with the Liverpool City Council, and they've kindly provided some of this information about their most current updates. So you may be familiar with Trees for Climate. It's an England-wide program um, that's just started uh, not that long ago, just a few months ago, really. Um, and it was funded as part of the Nature for Climate Fund. So six, you know, nearly 7,000 hectares of new wetland or new woodland. And um, in the first year so far, the 10 community forests have created 450 hectares of new woodlands. Um, and then their tar target is going to double um, in the next uh, in the next year. Um, so that does include Liverpool. So I have struggled a little bit with seeing everything being called like woodland. Um, there's the Northern Forest Initiative. They're not necessarily woodlands as we would think it in such it's such terms. It's more increasing tree cover when and where you can in areas that are suitable for it. So that, there's also the Northern Forest Plan, um, which I'll show you a map of in a moment, but it looks all the way across the North. It's included in the 25 year environment plan. It was launched in 2018 and funded by DEFRA. Um, and the Woodland Trust, who's already spoken, is involved with, with that, of course. Um, but the, this, this information is from the Mersey Forest and it, addresses you know a number of different issues uh, relating to the environment and the north of England you know that includes climate change uh, the health issues which obviously the north has a lot of um, health and well well-being issues as well um, biodiversity it has very low tree cover in a lot of these places in the north and um, the idea of kind of creating a woodland culture, getting all these different people involved. So as you see, this includes some of the most industrialized cities in England, as well as the areas around it. And they've kind of looked at where they might prioritize it. So when you hear the Northern Forest, you might think of a vast swathe of woodlands leading across the North, but um, it's not quite that. It's, it's planting in areas where you can opportunistically plant them and where those areas are needed. And not everywhere is suitable for trees, as we've talked about a number of times. So of course it has a number of um, benefits that link back to what I was talking about with the idea of nature-based solutions, and those are um, environmental benefits. Um, as well as health and well-being benefits. Air quality is a major issue, particularly in a lot of these, these cities in the north of England. And the improved kind of image of these, these areas, there's all sorts of effort going into, you know, northern powerhouse and all of these different sorts of things. And greening can be part of that. It doesn't have to be just about economic development. So it's, it's occurring across all these different land types because there's not a lot of that is public land you're having to work with a lot of different groups and a lot of private um, landholders to actually achieve these targets. You know, the Northern Forest aims to um, plant 50 million trees over the next 25 years. That's going to require working with a lot of different people and using any available land that you can if it's suitable for woodland. And then there's something called the Northern Flower House um, that's more of a bottom-up initiative. And I quite like the concept. It's a response to the idea that we're going to have a Northern powerhouse. Why not a Northern flower house? Um, and also acknowledging that it's not just about trees. There are other um, types of ecosystems that could benefit from greening and enhanced biodiversity. And those can provide really big gains. So. Um, one of the things that I will say is that it's, of course, you know, not just are only about trees, which 
several people have already said. Um, you have different types of ecosystems that can actually sequester more carbon than trees. So don't, don't neglect those. Um, I'm personally partial to wetlands. Don't neglect your wetlands. They sequester more carbon than um, forests. Um, and also just maintaining what you have. There's this idea that we can green cities, but what we found in Liverpool and what they found in Reading and other places is that it's actually really difficult once you lose your green space to retrofit it later. Um, so do your very best to avoid, um, I think we undersell protecting those habitats and then enhancing what we have. So if you deem it poor quality green space, rather than getting rid of it, it's better to enhance that quality of green space because later on it's gonna be much more difficult to retrofit. Um, and I think that bottom up um, community greening is really, can play an important role. I mean, particularly in these areas that are facing pretty severe budget cuts over, you know, a very long period of time it's been in Liverpool. Um, that's sometimes the only way that you can get things done. Um, and so, you know, I already talked about how you, if you can't have trees in the ground, there are other things you can do. Um, but all of this has to be part of a wider scale perspective. And that's why I scaled out beyond Liverpool to show that there is kind of an overall vision and you know, desire to green the north over a wider scale. So a lot of those urban green up initiatives are tiny, but to make a difference, they're going to have to be part of a bigger plan. Um, and then um, co-benefits um, are often more enticing than just climate change alone. And I think it's really good that so many of you have already mentioned when you're speaking about all the different co-benefits that it's not just about climate change. Um, and I think that can really uh, engage people a lot more because when we've done a lot of our social surveys, we found that those sort of um, other types of benefits have um, really engaged people and, and make them tend to support greening more because they they just feel good when they're in green spaces. And there's some um, links if you're interested in, I'm not sure if um, these PowerPoints will be sent out, but that's all from me. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, we're actually going to go straight into our Q&A now. Um, so if all of the other speakers would like to turn their cameras um, and microphones on, um, and I'd also like to invite um, Mike to join us as well, and Councillor William Wertlow. Um, my colleague Josh is going to be facilitating this part of the event, and we've got until about two o'clock. We've had loads of questions submitted, so keep your answers um, nice and concise so we can get through as many as possible. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Emma, and uh, really, really enjoyed all of those presentations. Really fantastic to hear about so much that's really good that's happening. Um, to start off, I'm going to address the first one to Mike. Um, having heard some of, kind of what's been said today, um, you'll be aware that the Environment Bill is due to return to Parliament later this year. Um, what, would, what kind of provisions would you like to see in that legislation and support for these kind of local, local groups um, to, to really enable this best practice to be scaled up? Well, I, I think, and good afternoon, and thank you for so many experts on before me. Uh, it's always good to have experts on before a politician. That's uh, a wonderful thing. And can I say, as someone who lives in the middle of my town, I'm enormously proud of my constituency. Um, I know Reading very well and I know Liverpool quite well as well. And the, the regeneration that's been done in the Docklands in Liverpool is quite remarkable. Um, and for a short period of time, I was at White Nights in, in Reading, which is also a remarkable park. But we mustn't take our environment here for granted. And I think one of the things that the bill coming through the house now will in, enforce in law and give the relevant agencies the, the powers, if you wish, to tell when people are not doing what they should be doing, whether it be in development or whether it be in litter, which we've seen lots of comments around about mm -hmm. litter at the moment. And it just doesn't have to be, as your previously about trees. The bill actually is about the environment as a whole. Now, we're the furthest away from the sea anywhere in the country here, but actually we flood in my the natural park right next to where I'm sitting here now on a regular basis, and that's nature's way, and that's what she's the floodplains plains of for. But I, I worry about my chalk streams, um, and trees are living things. They 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 die. So but when they do die, for other sadly through disease, but ultimately old age, we have to replace them with something which is physically useful going through on for the next three or four hundred years as well. So I, I think what we the biggest thing that the bill can do. For people is feel that they're empowered to give the local authorities the power and the planners in power to say to the developers yes we do need new housing this town is still called a new town even though it's 70 odd years old 
Um, but the planners did a fantastic job when they developed this town. And, and literally every single ward has that green area, has that play area, has that little bit of woodland, has that forest. And of course, I've got more trees in my constituency than I have constituents because I have the Asridge Forest in my constituency and the bluebells are due literally any day now. And so it's going to be the most beautiful. But we have to protect it as well. Um, my farmers would always say that they're the custodians of, of the land up there. And they are, they are very worried, for instance, at the moment, that, at the amount of litter and refuse that's being dropped at the bridleways and the footpaths. And some of the bridleways footpaths are in really bad conditions at the moment. So we need to have that sort of power going forward, Josh, I think. Thanks very much, Mike. I want, want to go to uh, William next. Um, William, as a councillor, what kind of support would you like to see from central governments um, for some of these kind of best practices and initiatives that we've heard about today? Oh, that's that's a great one. I'm county councillor, um, but I'm actually currently a candidate, so uh, perhaps I'm, my title should be slightly different um, as we have elections in May. Support from central government is going to be needed only if we can't get enough support from the community, from our own businesses, from our own local volunteers, and so on. And the sort of things which I have come across have been the Woodland Trust offering to provide trees. And that was fantastic. And um, it meant that I was able to get a list of all spaces that the council uh, the county council owns in the decorum area and pass that on to people who are then going to run active campaigns as to what should be done with those spaces. Central government is really only needs to make sure that we have got enough money to do <laughs> what we need to build a sustainable Hertfordshire. That is the program that the County Council has put together. And if central government fails to provide us with at least the money we've had in the past, we're going to not, we're not going to be able to achieve what's needed. So that's my first message. Okay. I think perhaps Surprise, someone maybe. else would. <laughs> I would pull yeah, that's fantastic, thank you. And Mike and I both uh, run in the same park regularly. <laughs> um, I'd like to open this up now to the other panellists um, to kind of speak about any areas where they feel that um, there are kind of uh, barriers or blockages or just areas that need more support um, centrally or even locally um, to kind of enable, enable them to um, really push forward with the initiatives that they've spoken about today. So um, if any of the panellists would like to come in on that. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to go first. I, I just wanted to say, picking up on the point that uh, Sir Mike Penning uh, pointed out, yes, farmers are the um, custodians of, of the future. And I know this strays a bit from my brief, it's more about development, um, but, but certainly um, farmers have a key role to play in this, um, you know, uh, transition to a much more environmentally uh, harmonious um, future. The new environmental land management schemes that are being brought in thanks to the Agriculture Act um, are key to delivering this, but um, one thing that uh, is being trialled as part of this is agroforestry, and I don't just mean rows of trees um, in, uh, in, in fields, uh, although spaced, you know, so that uh, there are people can uh, make way for agricultural vehicles through them. I mean, hedgerows maintenance, hedgerow restoration as well. Uh, a, an increase of 40% um, in hedgerows could play an enormous part uh, in helping to uh, tackle uh, a lot of the um, issues facing, uh, you know, farming environments, including biodiversity um, losses, um, and you know, and loss of wildlife, loss of pollinators, and all, all of these factors, which, which have been, you know, um, affecting many landowners for for many years now. Um, so, so there are, you know, not necessarily intrusive. Um, solutions, but, but certainly solutions that are being brought out and need to be um, expanded and um, taken up more widely if they are to prove a success. Uh, 
What's happening, Josh? Tim. Yeah, I'd like to pick up a, a point that Sir Mike uh, raised there, which is really pertinent to um, the Hemel Hempstead decorum area and Hertfordshire wide. Uh, and that's our, that we are a county under water stress. Yes. And uh, because there are just so many demands on our water from the aquifer, um, we're also blessed with 10% of the world's chalk rivers in, in Hertfordshire, uh, obviously a globally rare resource. And uh, we have to balance up keeping water in those rivers to support the unique biodiversity with um, the potential for having to water trees. And that's why I made the point earlier that uh, from the Wildlife Trust perspective, wherever we can rely on natural regeneration to um, achieve new woodlands, it's far, far better um, for the environment and for the other habitats that we have in Hertfordshire. I mentioned the example from, from Harpenden and St. John's Wood. Literally within 50 years, if you've got the right conditions and you've got the right source of seeds to come in, uh, nature will, will create our woodlands for us and they will be beautifully adapted to the local soils and the local environment. And as they develop, we'll go through the phases to use a rugby analogy, such that you, know, you do get those scrubby areas, you'll get the areas of grassland. What we're lacking um, in this country now are any um, natural interventions for our woodland. We, we've lost those big herbivores that used to smash through our woodlands and, and open up spaces. Um, and uh, unfortunately, as a result of that, the need for managing our woodlands is really, really important to maintain yeah. that diversity. And uh, it's a point I touched on earlier that um, in the State of Nature report, which I mentioned, woodlands actually increased by 9% since 1970. Um, but in that time, we've also lost 26 species associated with woodlands and 65 have shown noticeable declines. And the reason for those extinctions and declines is because our ancient woodlands and our other older woodlands just aren't being managed to maintain that diversity. So whilst clearly there should be um, a lot of attention on increasing the amount of wildlife habitats, I mentioned the, the 22,000 hectares that need to be created in Hertfordshire, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we have a wonderful resource of habitats within our county and across the country. And those, those habitats need managing desperately and caring for to make sure that we don't lose further diversity in the future. Thank you, Tim. Natalie, I think you've had your hand up for a while. Thank you. Yeah, I think one sort of real opportunity is around connecting children, particularly with nature, and that a big barrier I see at the moment in terms of in terms of schools is making that time to connect children with nature because I think a lot of us probably here already have that intrinsic sense of the value of nature but we're looking now I think the need for equipping young people to take that role in protecting the climate in supporting biodiversity especially in these urban environments and um you know, this sort of thing has been recognised with, with Attenborough, with the Descoupta um, report as well. And I just think it's really, um, I know the Forest School Association at the moment are really pushing for a nature premium in the same way that schools have a sport premium to sort of extra, extra funding in, in schools to enable that. But I think we answer a lot of the challenges by connecting young people with nature in terms of sort of creating a future where people are going to care about nature and, and take action to protect it. Unless, oh sorry, go on, oh, please. Sorry, I just wanted to pick up on, on those last two uh, points as well. I agree with both of, of what they said. Uh, natural regeneration is certainly uh, a much uh, more effect, cost effective and, and simpler solution. Uh, and, and obviously gets rid of the, around the problem of having to source trees from somewhere else um, or, or other parts of the UK. Um, so I absolutely agree, natural re regeneration should be the first um, step considered in any kind of um, expansion of um, woodland um, habitats. Uh, although in order to ensure that uh, the seedlings that come up are uh, survived to maturity, there needs to be uh, greater uh, control of uh, uh, species that are gonna eat those seedlings um, and uh, that needs to be taken into account in any um, sort of 
um, management taking place in that woodland. I, I do agree with the point that um, woodland uh, ha management has declined shockingly. Our latest State of UK Woods and Trees report shows that only 7% of native woodlands are in a good ecological condition, and that's because there has been a shocking decline in the management of woodlands. I, I just on the other point as well, um, and I should say, so management of woodland is something that, that I, I think could be pushed more strongly by um, central and local government um, uh, as well. Um, I, I just thought on Natalie's point, um, engaging with um, school children um, as well is absolutely key and it's something that the Woodland Trust is very um, big on. Um, in my first um, week, uh, I went and planted a thousand trees with a school in Burton-on-Trent, um, which was a massive undertaking and, and actually 23% of all schools in the UK have applied to plant trees with the Woodland Trust uh, Trees for Schools program. So that's certainly something to look up if you are involved in that area, um, as it is a very popular and very effective program at getting young people involved in the basics of um, engaging with nature. Thank you very much, everyone, for that. Um, I'm going to move the conversation on a little bit now to um, towards accessing um, green spaces and woodlands. So we've heard a lot about the benefits of, um, of having regular encounters and access to these kind of spaces. What barriers do communities such as Temel Hampstead face in kind of in making sure they are able to regularly access these spaces? And how can they be overcome? Um, and I'd like to hear particularly from any kind of person that hasn't spoken yet. But if not, anyone else is free, 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 free to come in as well. So, Josh, from my point of view, um, we, we are really very lucky to have so much access to the countryside. And I think one of the, if there's going to be any benefit from the COVID crisis we've had, is it's the ability of people that have never been in the countryside hardly at all before to, to get into the countryside. And to see it in a different way. It's not just about woodland. Um, it's actually the countryside as a whole and understanding, you know, for instance, so, you know, I've got, I haven't got a huge um, um, dairy herd. Actually, I've only got one milk dairy herd in my constituency, but we've got a lot of sheep. But for people being educated and understanding that yes, they can enjoy the countryside, but they don't want to endanger the animals there, controlling their dogs, for instance, is a big issue. You know, so pe people being educated. And going back to, I think, Natalie's point, um, the children get this. You know they really do, and and I and we're very lucky. We've got a lot of woodland classrooms in in my primary schools. But if you go to the schools and you talk to them about plastic and you talk about the environment, and they they actually really really get it. And I think we can encourage them to take mum and dad or grandma out in, in into into the woodland and into the countryside more by by and, and increase their health and their mental health as well. This is something which we everybody's touched on so far. But we are very lucky here. I mean, I'm not saying all the brighter ways and all the footpaths are perfect. Um, actually, some of them have been very overused, as I mentioned earlier on, but some of them are still being underused. But if we can encourage people to use them, then, then it's a lot easier to maintain them. And going back to Owen's point to do with, you know, I have a, a fantastic forest owned by the National Trust in my constituency, which is, you know, unbelievable. But it's in danger because of the amount of deer that are eating the, the saplings and, as, and, and the bark off the trees that you've got, because there's no natural predators to them. Um, and everybody gets very upset when the, the National Trust talk about culling, but it has to happen, otherwise that forest will die. Uh, and, and so management also costs money. And this is one of the areas which I think perhaps central government, when they look at their grants and as they push the money out from central government, you know, if you want to manage a forest, it costs a lot of money. Charcoal perhaps is an answer. It's an industry, a historic industry, that's actually been going on here for many, many years and copsing and managing it. But you, we can't just leave forest to be on its own because it, frankly, will die back. It, it just won't survive. It has to be managed. Um, and going very quickly onto the, the history of really, really old forests. I mean, we have to protect some of the forests that are not as old as that, not 400 years old. Um, it, it, well, 500 years, I think it goes back to the 17th century to say you know, those, those forests. Because, for instance, as I've read, Ash Ridge is not that old. A lot of it was planted by a landowner several hundred years ago, but not thousands of years ago. So we need to, to work on it and find out different ways of managing it with a different generation of people that are going into those forests. 
Thank you, Mike. Tim, do you want to come on that? Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. Um, I mentioned earlier about you know, the, the fact that um, our, our, our woodlands just become so samey after a while, and we lose that structural diversity, which uh, many of the species, the butterflies, the breeding birds, uh, the mammals, all depend upon within those woodlands. And it's just become so difficult for, for landowners to find a, a, a commercial reason for, for managing woodlands, and therefore nothing is being done to them. Uh, we need to look again at traditional uses of, of woodlands and find some way of making them relevant in um, the, the 21st century such that landowners are able to um, get some sort of return for, for that woodland. And um, I've been reading a, an excellent book I would recommend to everybody uh, called the, the, the Wood by John Lewis Stemple. Um, and it's his experience of, of looking after a, a Gloucestershire wood for a year. And, you know, we shouldn't lose sight of uh, the fact that um, animals can live within those woods. Pigs, cattle can, can all make a living. So if it's part of a bigger system, uh, there's the potential then to get that structure, to get that, that use of the woodlands back again, such that we do maintain that, that wonderful biodiversity. And um, I, I saw on the news earlier this week, I think it was uh, one, a Woodland Trust report, which I Owen mentioned there, um, the fact that uh, it's the ancient woodlands or semi-natural semi ancient woodlands are far and away the most important in terms of carbon storage. So again, that, that's all part of that, that looking after our, our critical natural capital um, going forward um, to do that. And then let's think about how we, um, we establish bigger, better woodlands for, for the future. Re really important how, how we can uh, make woodlands work in the 21st century, I, I think. So that was just a, a follow up in terms of structural um, uh, diversity within woodlands and maintained by the first. But I, I also just wanted to raise a point that we've been talking about in St. Albans now within our tree action group there. And that's how we need to conserve and love existing mature street and parkland trees um, within Hertfordshire and everywhere else, because it seems that there seems to be, it, it seems to be too easy that, you know, 200, 200 year old trees, which are growing alongside our roads or in our parklands, if they have any measure of uh, risk associated with them from a bit of rot, they seem to be taken down too easily and the whole tree is taken down and you lose all that locked up carbon in the process of doing that. Um, I think, again, we need to have a, a much more uh, holistic uh, way of looking at, at these, these street and parkland trees such that we try and conserve them for as long as possible because they can't be replaced with 50 or 100 um, saplings being put in the ground that you know they just won't have that same function so um, I know here in St Albans we, we are working with tree officers there to try try and save as many of those trees and, and keep that carbon locked up and keep that tree standing because it has landscape value it has cultural value clearly biodiversity value as well but they, they seem to be lost too easily at the moment so uh, that's the thing that I think I would I would champion amongst everybody here today is, you know, try and keep those mature trees standing for as, as long as possible. Thank you, Tim. Um, William, I think you had a hand raised. The County Council maintains a register of all public footpaths within the county. These need to be managed, to be kept open, kept clear, but also we need to ensure that they are wide enough for current use. Um, I think what part of what I'm saying is that we need people to keep be on the alert for any sort of uh, infringement of the width of those footpaths by just shifting the fences a little bit and that sort of thing. And I feel that the, there should be a very simple way for all residents that which encourages them to use those footpaths and report any issues knowing that something will be done now we have the volunteers we have the walking groups in 
in decorum at least, um, who are quite quite numerous. Um, you can find a walk to go on in decorum every day of the week. We need to make sure though, that there is no encroachment. Um, Owen, I think um, you've got your hand up and I think it's gonna to have to be the last word because of time constraints, so Owen. Uh, oh, no, sorry, I, I was going to say something about, about street trees, but I see that uh, Mermie Cargo has her hand up as well, and she hasn't spoken yet. Uh, Mermie, thank you. Yes, I would like to mention that there's, a, there's in the chat, there's a discussion going along about the lack of proximity to woodlands or any other natural areas to many people in the population. And that that mm -hmm. is one reason, one big reason for bringing woodlands into Housing areas or other kinds of natural areas. So we, we need Flash to remember that, that as well. Thank you very much, Mummy. I'm so, afraid. Josh, sorry, we... I have to break away. My apologies, but I'll. That's okay. Thank, thank you very much for attending, Mike. Um, right. um, Emma, I think we'll have to go back to you, I'm afraid. We're out of time on the QA. But thank you very much for everyone for your contributions there. Yes, thank you so much um, for a brilliant Q&A and for everyone for their contributions. I can ask you all to turn your cameras off now um, and to mute yourselves. Uh, Dennis, um, if you're there, if you'd be happy to turn your um, video on. Um, so I'd finally like to welcome our last presenter this afternoon, Dennis Fennell. Uh, Dennis began his natural history career on the film unit of the RSPB. Um, and after national service in the RAF and a stint in marketing, the strong pull of conservation brought him back to life as a full-time writer, artist, photographer, lecturer, and broadcaster, specializing in the countryside conservation and environment consultancy. Uh, Dennis joins us in this final presentation to reflect on this career in conservation and his local expertise and experiences of protecting, maintaining, and creating woodlands local to Hemel Hempstead, but also elsewhere. Um, Dennis, I'll hand over to you now to, to wrap it up. Um. Hi Dennis, you should be able to understand. That's a little better, yes. Uh, uh, Perfect. Now I've, we, I've heard an awful lot about science and um, and so much the better. But um, what I want to really um, talk about is the the wonder, the magic of uh, of of the countryside and and woodland. Now, first of all, I, I in order that I didn't miss any points, I I prepared a few words. So now I'm going to read them because I I feel it's important that I don't gallop on. I've always been fascinated by woodlands, the trees themselves, but also the myriad of wildlife that inhabits them. It's a love affair that began during my childhood in Devon and Cornwall and continued after my family moved to Chiswick. I was devastated by this move, away from the countryside, the big city, but it wasn't long before I discovered Barn Elms Reservoir, now the London Wetland Centre, and I spent many happy hours there and met, met people who were doing a duck count Naturally, I asked if I could join in. One of them was particularly kind, a sort of mentor, and encouraged me to look at the RSPB. I'd just left school and I was looking for work, so I took up his suggestion and was lucky enough to get a job with the RSPB, based then in Eccleston Square in Victoria. I was a general dog's body and a very junior member of the two-man film unit, me and George Edwards. National service intervened, marriage and responsibility meant the need to earn money. In between this, I moved to Hemel Hempstead and began a career in management. But I kept my interest in the natural world ticking along by volunteering as a warden at Tring Reservoirs, then under the umbrella of the Nature Conservancy Council. And my wife and I discovered Ashridge Forest, which became our go-to place to recharge our batteries. I also took up photography and painting, birds mainly, and discovered a talent for writing about wildlife subjects. I began writing for a health magazine, my brief being to make the point that the natural world is enormously beneficial for our well-being, something we are now more aware of than ever. In 1969, I met Gordon Benningfield, a local artist 
at an art exhibition in the old pavilion. We had similar ideas about conservation and I began a more active role in the field. Straw burning was the issue of the day back then. The miles and miles of multi-species hedgerows, hedgerow trees and field trees, especially oaks, that was destroyed and this was completely unsustainable. And I like to think that Gordon and I were partly instrumental in getting it banned. Gordon also introduced me to Palastock Forest in Dorset, where we were able to stop the felling of this ancient woodland about to be planted with conifers. In 1978, I took a major step and left the rat race and joined the mouse race. I wrote my first book in 1980 and used my own photographs, paintings and drawings, something I've done ever since. This led to broadcasting, encouraged by Brian Matthew of BBC Two's Round Midnight programme. I went on to make my own programmes for local and national radio and television, including LBC, Anglia Television and Channel 4, as well as Dawn Chorus programmes from local wetlands. Over the centuries, woodlands provided the means to make things, and those in decorum have no exception. Many of the Chiltern woodlands were planted for the furniture trade, long before plastics were even thought of. Trees were once coaxed into certain shapes to create ornate roofs for churches and houses. Cracked barns are a good example. They were used for timbers for ships, coppice to provide wood for tools and fences. Chair budgers plied their trade on decorum's wooded hillsides and turned ash, cherry, yew and beech into Windsor chair spindles for the furniture workers of High Wycombe. These woodlands, once used to provide small timber for turning, now provide for our well-being. But currently, 93% of UK woodland is under threat. Only 7% is in good condition. All too often, trees are felled to make way for building projects, road or rail. They're the victims of our constant and destructive tree, tree seeking after growth and development. Every housing estate means the death of trees, either at the time of development or later, because they've lost their stability through root damage or lack the support of their fellow forest dwellers. And we mustn't forget that it's not only the trees we lose, but the host of organisms dependent upon these great plants, ourselves included. It's become the norm to replace trees cut down for development. Unfortunately, all too often the replacements are foreign source, whips and sapling. This happens a lot in the past. Indeed, it's still happening today. Imports allow diseases in, such as Dutch elm, ash dieback and oak dieback. Many of the beautiful horse chestnuts with their candelabra flowers planted on the Boxmoor Trust in Victorian times have been brought low by blight and leaf mining moth larva. The Chiltern beechwoods are threatened by sooty bark disease and by neglect. Britain has under undergone many cycles of climate change, the last a mere 10,000 years ago. At that time, the area was covered in ice, the ground hard iron with permafrost. And on the Boxmore Trust, there are several pingos, not small cartoon fluffy penguin chicks, but shadows in the soil of ice lenses left behind as the glaciers that shaped our countryside retreated and nature began the process of healing. It was, of course, just another aspect of global warming as the glacier ice melted in just over a century. The newly created British Isles was soon clothed in an immense forest of ash, elm, oak, lime, silver birch, willow, hazel and Scots pine. How do we know this? We've only got to look at our wildlife, particularly our native birds, blackbirds, robins, finches, titmice, song and missile thrush, goss and sparrowhawk. They all have rounded wings and long tails, particularly useful in tight spaces between branches and tree trunks. As for the mammals, extinct species like wolves, brown bear and lynx, as well as extant species like foxes, badgers, hedgehogs, red squirrels, wildcats, pine martins, they're all woodland species. Even the butterflies uh, that are those of woodland or woodland edge. Then humans arrived on the scene 
To begin with, only a few trees were burned or felled, and then only with flint axes. However, it wasn't long before people discovered bronze and later iron. Foundries needed charcoal to provide enough heat, and so the forest retreated. Farming began. Sheep need a secure landscape with no bears, wolves or lynx. Naturally, the predators drew the short straw and over several centuries were exterminated. Now, the British Isles is the least wooded country in the whole of Europe not a record to be proud of, and it's high time we did something about it, one of the reasons we're having this discussion today. Hopefully we are just coming out of a pandemic, but during the enforced lockdowns huge numbers of people have discovered or rediscovered nature, and what a joy it is to walk through woodland, even small fragmented pieces of woodland. A year ago the paths bore only a few signs of Wellington boot prints or paw prints, now some of the paths are twice as wide as they used to be, flattened by a host of feet, desperate to get away from the television screen and another horrifying statistic. Just at the moment, our woodlands are showing the most magnificent carpet of bluebells, a springtime speciality of the British Isles, hardwood trees in a sea of blue. A woodland walk has a calming influence. Nature heals. After a heart operation in November, I was advised to take a daily walk. Not too far. Happily, the Gade Valley is just on my doorstep. It was the best of all medicines and I'm grateful for it. Lately, I've been enjoying the peacock, brimstone and small tortoiseshell and orange tip butterflies, looking for nectar. These jewel-like little insects have been hibernating in the woods, without which they would have vanished. Knowing this, what can we do? to protect our vanishing woodlands. And here I'm giving you my personal views as a naturalist, not necessarily the views of the Boxmore Trust, an ancient common land trust with 12 elected trustees of which I'm one. One of the things that the Boxmore Trust has been doing is to grow the land in its care. Originally a gift from Elizabeth I to Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, some 430 years ago, when I was elected, over 30 years ago for life. We had 168 acres and we now have increased our holding to almost 500 acres, the vast majority of which has got public access, full public access, and with thousands of trees of varying species in our care. I know we need to build houses, yet proposed plans for decorum don't take into consideration the needs for nature. We simply cannot keep on building. Around the world, global warming is creating conflict over land and water. Migration is inevitable. We have the skills and the technology to help the underdeveloped world. We should do so. However, we should lead by example and use these skills to rewild our own country and take some of the pressure off, off the natural world. I count myself to be extremely lucky to live in the British Isles, especially in the Chilterns. And my message is, please don't let us mess it up. Instead of planting whips and saplings, plant seeds of native trees and watch them grow. Guard them as you should all trees. Then you are passing on something rare and precious, a green and sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. That was a really, really wonderful to hear, really engaging um, presentation there. And actually, what I want to speak to you about engagement because you, you spoke so so movingly about kind of the, the loss that we've, we face, but also some of the kind of joys that we could um, we could have. Um, how do you think that is? What's the best way to engage with people and policymakers across the country to make them kind of understand, you know, the the value of these green spaces, these woodlands, um, and to in, ensure that you know people can get behind this sentiments that um, um, these things need protection and um, to be uh, you know, maintained for future generations. Sorry, Dennis, you're just on mute there. Can you uh, unmute yourself? Uh, it's still muted, I'm afraid, Dennis. You, um, can you unmute yourself in the bottom left corner?
I'm really sorry, Dennis, I'm going to have to cut across here because um, you still can't get that mute fun that function working. Um, but I'll bring back to Emma to close up the event. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, hopefully you'll be able to unmute um, eventually, Dennis. Um, so that brings us to a close. Uh, thank you so much, Dennis, for rounding us off so nicely today. Um, I think we can all agree that was a really nice way to end the event. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers for their contributions today and for starting this discussion, which is one we obviously want to continue. Um, that's all we've got time for, but please do look out for a follow-up email that will be coming next week, which will have a recording of the event and also some more information um, on Woodlands for All and Hemel Hempstead uh, from Decorum Council as well on their uh, Climate Action Network and from Hope for the Future and anything the speakers would like to pass on to. Um, so at Hope for the Future, we're big believers in making climate campaigning as open and accessible as possible uh, through each training session. Al although each training session costs us a fee to run, uh, we do offer the support for free to make sure that everyone can have their voice heard on the issues affecting them and their planet. Uh, so we're just asking if you're able to make a small donation to help continue our work, um, then you can find all the information about doing so on our website. Um, and I'll include more information in the follow up email. So all that's left to say is thank you again to our wonderful speakers. Thank you to our constituency team for all of your uh, hard work on this event. Our Hope for the Future team behind the scenes and on camera today, and a huge thank you to you for attending. Uh, a feedback form should pop up in your browser shortly. Uh, so if you can fill that in, that would be great. But I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon and happy Earth Day. <laughs>